Castellani is a successful arts and antiques dealer working for the Sheffield Company. Her typical day starts with a call with her assistant Kylie, going over the schedule set up for the day, or discussing the latest acquired painting or vintage silver ladles. Kylie's organizational skills have been a blessing for Tess, allowing her to put more time and effort into preparing for the interview with Sheffield. She's been aiming to get that promotion at their New York office, so Kylie has been helping her get ready by practicing answering interview questions. Kylie tells her the interview with Sophia Sheffield will be tomorrow. When they reach Tess's office, they see the Pissarro painting waiting for her appraisal. Tess knows it's an excellent example of a pentimento, an art term referring to a painting hiding inside another painting. It's one of the things Tess likes about her work. Later that day, Tess gets notified about the baby shower organized by her good friends Suzette and Lydia for their baby. She leaves her office early to buy presents. After the party ends, the couple tells Tess they want her to be their child's godmother. Tess is honored, but she expresses her doubts about being a good one. You see, Tess is an only child raised by a single mother, who's been absent for almost half her life. She doesn't think she can be a good example to set for her godson, but Lydia expresses her faith that she can depend on her when it matters, and so can her son. Tess is flattered and accepts the role. As she stands up, she suddenly feels dizzy, and sits again. It seems like in her preparation for the big interview, she has neglected her sleep and eating habits. Lydia insists on packing her some food to eat, and having Suzette drive her home. But when she gets home, Tess just puts the food in her refrigerator, as she has no time to eat. She needs to sleep early for her interview tomorrow. She goes to her little corner of antiques and trinkets, and there, she sees pictures of her and her mother. Despite not seeing her for a long time, Tess is hoping her mother will respond to her messages. The next day, Tess and Kylie are practicing interview questions again, when a man in a suit approaches them. He's Demnaic McCauley, and he's been trying to contact Tess for a few days now. He wants to discuss with her about her family, to which she refutes she doesn't have any. But since there are still 15 minutes left before she meets with Sheffield, Tess relents and gives him five minutes of her time in her office. Without ado, Demnaic tells her he's here on behalf of Magnus Johansson, her paternal grandfather. He recently passed away. In his will, he has named Tess to inherit half of his estate, named Bella Vista, a 50-acre apple orchard in Archangel, California. As the will's executor, Demnaic's job is to make sure Tess knows it and signs the papers. But Tess is speechless. All her life, her mother has never told anything about her father, even less so about his side of the family. She has grown up believing her father abandoned her. And now, in just five minutes, she's about to inherit half of an estate from her supposed grandfather. She tells Demnaic she'll simply hand over her half to whoever inherits the other half. Demnaic says that will be Isabel, her half-sister. Tess, taking in too much information and adding it to the pressure of the interview, faints in Demnaic's arms. When she comes to, she finds herself in the hospital. The doctor reprimands her for not taking care of her health. Tess has been traveling a lot due to her work, causing her to miss her meals and sleep time. The doctor wants her to stay there for a few hours, but she insists she needs to go back to her office for the interview. Eventually the doctor relents, on the condition that she'll schedule another checkup, and because she has a friend to take her home. Tess is puzzled. Then the doctor reveals Demnaic sitting just outside the curtain, patiently waiting. Demnaic pushes Tess's wheelchair towards the parking lot. He says he's sorry about the interview. It turns out Sheffield has rescheduled it and boarded a flight to Singapore. Tess makes a gesture of standing up, but she still feels a little light in the head. She would have collapsed again, if not for Demnaic catching her. There's a little tension there, but he makes an effort to make light conversation. He says he's been to Hawaii, Japan, Korea, and Djibouti, and Singapore is next on his list. Then he says he really needs to talk to her about the contents of the will. If he just lets her sign off her share right there and then, he'll be a very bad banker. Tess is surprised, as she first thought he was a lawyer. She wonders how a banker has been to so many places. Damnaik simply answers mysteriously that maybe he hasn't always been a banker. With that, he drives Tess home. Tess shares this recent turn of events with Lydia and Suzette. Through an internet search, they discover that Bella Vista is a gorgeous piece of land, suitable for vacations and getaways. But Tess doesn't feel inclined to go. How can she just go there, when all her life she didn't know they existed? Why has Magnus only reached out to her now, after his passing? Does her so-called family there even know about her? It's only understandable that she has so many questions about this whole affair. As she tells the couple, her mother has never told her anything about her father. She just left her daughter with the nanny and went off to travel the world. Suzette and Lydia point out she's exactly like her mother, always running from everything that ties her down. They even have the same job. They convince Tess that perhaps, this turn of events will be something she didn't know she needed. This may be the right time to open up to having a new family, even after all these years. Tess considers their advice greatly. And so, she texts Demnaic and tells him she's ready to go. They meet on a private tarmac, where he's already waiting for her. To Tess's surprise, Demnaic has a private plane, and is a licensed pilot. Now she understands why this attractive banker has been to so many places. Inside the plane, she asks him how Magnus passed. Demnaic says he suffered a heart attack while picking apples, and passed well on his way to the hospital. 
He adds that Magnus likes family, and has always made everyone feel like they're a part of it. Her skepticism and indifference show through, which prompts him to say he doesn't know why Magnus never reached out before. But Demnaic assures her he'll be there for any help she requires. Soon, the two are on their way to Bella Vista. He points out the neat rows of apple trees that line the estate. She also sees the longhouse that's at the center of the land. Tess finds it hard to believe that she owns half of this gorgeous property. After landing, they are welcomed by Isabel. There is uncertainty in her eyes as she finally meets her half-sister. Tess is the same, especially when Isabel remarks how she looks a lot like their father. Unfortunately, Demnaic is expected at the bank, so he has to leave the two sisters on their own. But he assures Tess that Isabel is a genuine person, and that she will be fine. There is awkwardness in the car as they drive towards the estate. Isabel says she didn't know about Tess until the will. She grew up knowing she was an only child. She also addresses the elephant in the room, they can't be expected to act like family so soon, as it's never easy, given that they only just met. Tess says she can just call Demnaic to sign off her inheritance to Isabel, and call it a day. But Isabel isn't comfortable with it. She wants to know her half-sister, so she convinces her to stay for a while. They enter the estate grounds. Isabel leads her to the back porch, where the rest of the family is waiting to meet Tess. Well, technically not a family, but as Demnaic said earlier, Magnus liked to make everyone feel like they belonged. The members are mostly estate helpers. The prominent ones are the siblings, Ernesto and Estella, who warmly welcome Tess. Everyone seems to want to know more about her, asking her about her work, or just telling her about random things. Estella warns everyone not to crowd her. All this familial closeness and kinship are foreign to Tess, and they indeed crowd her at some moments. She asks Isabel if there's a bathroom she can use. The latter directs her to the nearest one. However, instead of going to the bathroom, Tess wanders into Magnus's office. There, she sees Magnus's portraits with his wife, and other family pictures. She also sees several antiques along the hallway. She sends a voicemail to her mother informing her of where she is. After touring the house, she comes back to the back porch, to find Isabel alone putting away the plates. Isabel says everyone's waiting for the drama to unfold but she's not that type of a person. She's more of a homebody, having never been away from the orchard for most of her life. Pop and Bubby, her endearment for Magnus and his wife Eva, taught her domestic chores early on. By the time she was in her teens, she was practically involved in every aspect of the household. Tess is impressed, as Isabel is her total opposite. To ease the awkwardness between them, Isabel invites Tess to see the orchard. Isabel tells Tess most of the workers, who used to be immigrants and refugees, are living here on the estate, and that Magnus strived to maintain the atmosphere of family. Then she points to the two buildings nearby. The larger one is where they process the picked apples, while the smaller, farther one used to be Eva's farm stand. She used to sell pies and jams, as well as antiques and art pieces. Tess is amazed to find out about Eva's occupation, because her nan was in the same business. It's fascinating to know that the love for antiques runs in their family, on both sides. As they reach a small bridge, Isabel tells her about their father Eric. He passed away before she was born due to a car accident. Only his friend survived. Magnus and Eva never really talked about it, although they would tell her stories about Eric. She muses whether the real family heirlooms are the stories passed down to generations. And speaking of heirlooms, Magnus used to tell Isabel that their real treasure is in their home. She still doesn't know what it means. The next day, Tess joins Isabel and others in picking apples. She can see how her sister is good with kids. Ernesto, who is beside her, says Isabel gives school tours to teach children about harvesting and cooking, and she's great at it. Then, Isabel announces it's time to bake some apple pies, and of course, Tess should be there. Tess is having a lot of fun baking with the kids. They are savoring the pies they made when Demnaic arrives. He can see Tess fitting in well with Isabel, which is a good sign. Later he invites her for a walk. Tess says her sister is really nice, which makes her feel a little bit guilty for getting half of her multi-million dollar inheritance. But Demnaic corrects her, and tells the story behind Bella Vista. The estate is about to be foreclosed within a month, and it all starts with Eva Johansson. Eva came from a wealthy Jewish family who fled Germany in 1939. She met Magnus, who was a soldier for the Danish government, when the latter saved her from the war. They both fled to America and started this apple orchard. However, they found out Eva had cancer. She couldn't get insurance due to her pre-existing condition. They went broke paying for her treatment. Magnus couldn't, and wouldn't, sell the estate, because a lot of the workers were depending on him. After Eva passed, the orchard has never really recovered due to the following frost, and then drought. Tess isn't at all pleased to be told all of this now, because she has genuinely fallen in love with the place. To ease her worries, Demnaic invites her for horseback riding. They continue their conversation as they tour the orchard. He says he came from Ireland. He was wild when he was young, but when he came to America and joined the Navy, he changed. And when he met Magnus, he kind of adopted Demnaic. And that's how he got to be part of the Johansson family. They are resting when a woman runs to them. She's Lurds, who also works for the estate. She's the daughter of Carlos Calderon, the best friend of Tess's father. And she used to be Damnaic's girlfriend. 
She's frank and sometimes a little bit tactless. When she sees Tess, she remarks how she'll be the one to save the place. Tess is an antique dealer, so perhaps she could see some valuables that Eva used to own and then sell them to prevent foreclosure. It dawns on Tess why Dimnaik and Isabel want her here, and Isabel's remarks about finding treasure in their home. Hiding her hurt, she leaves them. Dimnaik follows her and tries to explain the real situation. But Tess tells him that family doesn't pretend you don't exist until they need something. With that, she flies back home. Suzette visits her to inquire about her visit to Bella Vista. Tess says she liked the place and the people, which makes it all the more hurtful when she found out they're only using her job to save the place. As she prepares her clothes for her interview with Sheffield tomorrow, she sees an envelope inside her bag. It contains pictures of Magnus and Eva, as well as her father Eric. Isabel must have sneaked it in. All in all, Tess doesn't know what to think of the experience. It doesn't help that her mother has never returned any of her calls, nor texted her back. Suzette advises her to not dismiss Bella Vista. She can take her time to think about it. The next day, Tess meets Sophia Sheffield. She's been preparing for this for a long time. However, after the interview, she isn't as enthused as before. Then she receives a call from Isabel. Her sister apologizes for what Lurd said. She wants to clarify that they genuinely want to know Tess and have her there in the estate. It's just that her expertise could be something that can save Bella Vista from being foreclosed. Isabel admits she doesn't want to lose the estate. She also admits that it's crazy to believe Magnus's words about hidden treasures inside the house. She's been looking, but she doesn't have high hopes for it. As Tess listens, she notices the picture of Magnus and Eva on her table. Through a magnifying glass, she can see that Eva wore a metal belt around her waist. She asks Isabel about some things. Her sister says all that Eva brought with them when they fled were a few trinkets and baubles. Her family's wealth was seized by the Nazis back then. Tess says that if Eva did plan to flee, then she might have brought something that was of considerable monetary value. Isabel says Eva could have brought her father's collection. Tess is in awe. She tells her sister it might be a long shot, but Magnus may be right about having treasure inside the house, literally. Tess returns to Bella Vista. In another of Eva's pictures, they can clearly see the metal belt, which has three distinct coins strung together. She explains that Jews used to sew valuables into their clothing so they could sell them for food, cross borders, or negotiate with their lives. It's possible Eva might have sewn those coins into her belt. And if Tess is right in her assumption, those coins could be Buster Collar, Class 1 coins. Only eight are known to have been produced. Four are in circulation, while the other four's locations are unknown. If Eva did have three of them, then it could solve their financial problems. Each coin can fetch just under $4 million. Tess asks if there's someone they can talk to to trace the coins. Isabel offers the information about Leon Calderon, the American soldier who helped Magnus and Eva escape. His son, Carlos, was their father's best friend and was with him during that car accident. But Carlos's whereabouts now are unknown. Rumors say he was a shady guy. He only left a few trinkets to his wife and his daughter Lourdes before fleeing. Magnus took them in when they had nothing. As they walk to the front lawn, Isabel expresses her amazement at this turn of events. She wants to preserve that hope that everything will be okay. Tess reminds her that authentication is still needed when the coins are found, but there's a great possibility that those are legitimately real. Isabel understands. She also expresses that she used to think Magnus was simply being emotional when he said those words about the treasure. Until the coins are found, they will not lose hope. Isabel leaves Tess to do something. Tess decides to send her mother a picture of Eva wearing her metal belt with the coins, and informs her of the possibility that the coins may be authentic. The next day, Isabel is seen baking bread and pastries for a booth that will be participating in the annual grape stomping event. As usual, Tess marvels at how her sister can do magic in the kitchen. Isabel says it's her dream to travel to places, try their cuisine, and bring them back here to teach the kids. Tess can imagine how Isabel can be successful with it. It can happen when they find the coins. But for now, she must prepare, as Isabel has signed her to join the grape stomping contest. Fortunately, Demnaic, who is the reigning champion, is there to assist her. Soon, Tess finds herself beside him, stomping on grapes and crushing them to pulp. By the end of the contest, Demnaic wins again, to no one's surprise. The two of them have a good time at the fair. Tess updates him about the coins and the possibility that they could be hidden somewhere in the house. He can see how she has grown to care for Isabel, the workers, and the estate. She says it's only right to preserve Magnus and Eva's legacy, as that is what they deserve, after all the kindness they gave during their time. The two of them share a short sweet moment, before giving a toast to the Johansons. Late in the afternoon, Demnaic drives Tess back to the house. It's already clear how the two of them are getting more comfortable with each other. But Tess needs to sort some things out in her personal life. When she enters the house, she sees her mother, Shannon, sharing a hearty laugh with Isabel. It's like all of her resentment comes rushing out. She blurts out all of her frustrations for not receiving any replies from her, and not having any kind of communication. She accuses Shannon of hiding information about her sister and grandparents, thereby denying her the family she's longed to have. Shannon had years to tell her, and yet she chose not to. Isabel approaches them to de-escalate the situation. 
Then she turns to Shannon and pleads with her to tell them everything. Shannon has no choice. She and Eric fell in love when they were still in college. What Shannon knew before was that Eric was separated from his wife and was processing a divorce. But she found out that the wife was pregnant and wanted to work things out with Eric. She couldn't bear the thought of breaking up a family, so she decided to break up with him and return to Ireland. It was then that she found out she was pregnant too. During Christmas, before she was set to return, she met Eric again. He found out about Shannon's pregnancy and wanted to take responsibility. He asked her to meet him the next day at a diner in Dolores Street. However, he never turned up. Shannon only knew about Eric's accident when she came to Ireland. If only she didn't agree to meet him, then he would still be alive today. However, it's in the past. They must focus on the present, on finding the coins. Shannon agrees that, based on the picture Tess sent her, the coins may be Buster Collar, Class 1. The three women decide to look inside Magnus's office for any clues. They don't find the coins, but they do find something hidden in Eva's portrait. It's a loan agreement for a house purchase. The collateral used was a coin collection, including three 1804 Buster Collar coins. Now this is proof, the proper documentation, that Eva did have them. The only question now, where are the coins? The next day, Shannon and Tess have a deep heart-to-heart -heart talk about their relationship as mother and daughter. Tess is still hurting because of the lack of emotional bond between them. For Shannon, she knew she had to do what was best for both of them. She included Tess in her travels, provided for her, and made sure she grew up well. On the other hand, she admits her mistakes and says she's proud of what Tess has become despite everything. But it isn't enough for the daughter. For the first time, Tess realizes she doesn't want to travel for the rest of her life. She doesn't want to end up like her mother, who doesn't have any roots to go back to who's always trying to run away from anything that ties her down. Shannon is hurt by this, but she says Tess can do what she wants. Maybe in time, she'll stop blaming Shannon for her choices. Still emotional after her conversation with her mother, Tess runs into the small barn that used to be Eva's farm stand. She calls Demnaic to fetch her. While waiting, she searches for anything that may help them find the coins. She finds one of Magnus's puzzle boxes. When she opens it, she sees a plane ticket and a hotel receipt, proof that Magnus did try to reach out to them before. But that was when her mother took her to travel elsewhere. Demnaic arrives, and Tess expresses her what-ifs about having a family back then. She feels robbed about what could have been, if only she knew about her father, about Magnus and Eva, and the orchard. About Isabel. Demnaic comforts her, telling her they can't control everything that happens in their lives. All they can do is flow with it, and make the best out of them. He shares about his experiences in the Navy, and all the risks and dangers that used to excite him. But now he's looking forward to new things in his life. He tries to change the subject by asking Tess about her work, and the promotion she's been preparing for. Tess gives a hollow laugh, and says it has changed. It's more managerial, far from personally dealing with clients, traveling, and researching history. She doesn't know if that's what she wants. Here in Bella Vista, she can be herself and simply breathe. But she knows she has to go back to Sheffield and deal with shops at Antiques Row. Just then, she makes a connection. Her mother said she was supposed to meet Eric at Dolores Street. The place is lined with antique shops and art galleries, that's why dealers know the street as Antiques Row. There's no probable reason why Eric wanted to meet Shannon there, unless he had something valuable to be pawned. Like the Buster Collar coins. Immediately, Tess flies back to San Francisco. She goes to the diner where her mother and Eric were supposed to meet. Beside it is the antique shop named Precious Treasures and Antiques. She inquires there, and gets the biggest break in her search for the coins. The owner confirms that a certain Eric Johansson made an appointment on Christmas Eve, according to the records. He was about to trade three Buster Collar, Class 1 coins. But he never made it. Later that day, someone named Carlos Calderon called to push through with the transaction. The owner then didn't allow it, because Carlos didn't have the proper papers and authentication. Tess meets with her mother after she visits the antique shop. Shannon has made inquiries about Carlos Calderon, and has found out he was deep in debt. It only makes sense that he tried to sell the coins to pay off his dues, but because he didn't have the papers, he wasn't able to. No one knows where he went after the car accident, but Tess won't give up. Perhaps he may have given something to his daughter before he ran away. At Bella Vista, she talks to Lourdes and inquires about her father. But the topic of Carlos Calderon is a sensitive one for her. She says she loved him, despite the rumors about him being shady. She has kept the trinkets he gave her, as they are all she ever has to remind her of her father. Tess still implores her to look. The search for the coins is about preserving Magnus's and Eva's legacy, more than anything else. But Lourdes leaves her. Tess and Isabel discuss their options about the coins when Lourdes approaches them. She gives them the envelope that contains Eva's metal belt. However, the coins are not there anymore. Isabel is upset about the possibility that Carlos might have taken them away after all. But Tess remembers Magnus's words, that Eva's treasure is here in their home. They can't give up unless they've scoured every inch of the place. They start looking again in Magnus's office. They recap the timeline of events, to make sense of where the coins could be hidden. But Isabel says Eva should have given the coins to Magnus, if she had it back. Lourdes adds that Carlos Calderon wasn't a man who would return what he stole. Tess has a sudden insight. 
She remembers seeing two letters, CC, scratched inside the puzzle box where she found the plane ticket and the hotel receipt. Could it be possible that CC stands for Carlos Calderon? Luckily, that box is already on the table. She opens it and looks for any switch or locks that may open another small compartment. Finally, she finds it. A secret space is installed in the lid. Inserted there is a mail address to Eva Johansson. When they open the envelope, they see a letter, and, lo and behold, the three buster collar coins. In the aftermath of the search, it's revealed that Carlos Calderon had a change of heart after stealing the coins from his best friend. He returned them, hoping to make things right. He also wanted Lourdes to know that he loved her. One year passes by. Many things have changed for Bella Vista. For one thing, it's been saved from being foreclosed. The sale of the coins is enough to cover the necessary expenses, and also allows Isabel to pursue her dreams of traveling and putting up a culinary school for kids. Meanwhile, Demnaic is now the official estate manager for Bella Vista. Tess is confident he'll live up to the job, since he'd been the trusted executor when Magnus was still alive. As for Tess, she has quit Sheffield, offering her position to Kylie. She decided to reopen Eva's farm stand and christened it, things remembered. She can't turn her back on the things she always loved to do but she thinks it's time to plant her roots in Bella Vista. She has made peace with her mother, who has always been proud of her. In this new chapter of her life, Tess has found who she really is, and what she's always wanted to do. And with Demnaic by her side, life will always offer new adventures for both of them.